Since the invention of mainstream radio and television, billions of watchers and listeners have tuned in for their dose of entertainment and education. But just imagine watching your favourite TV show or listening to the radio, only for it to be interrupted by a strange broadcast or mysterious message. It would definitely leave you confused and uneasy. Well, there have been many cases over the years where people have managed to hack into a station or show and interrupt it. And although it may seem like a harmless offence, it requires some sophisticated equipment and planning, and also carries a heavy punishment. So, here are five broadcasts that were either interrupted or hacked, and you're going to want to see number one because it is truly insane. Max Headroom Okay, I couldn't not include this one, and it's probably the most famous broadcast interruption out there, but you may not know the full story. It started on the evening of November the 22nd, 1987, when two bizarre broadcast signal intrusions confused thousands of watchers. The first took place during a primetime newscast on WGN-TV in Chicago, when, as highlights of the Chicago Bears' victory over the Detroit Lions was being shown, the screen suddenly went black. Then, after a few seconds, a person wearing a Max Headroom mask appeared on screen. In the background was a sheet of moving corrugated metal, and the man started moving around and jumping, imitating effects used in the Max Headroom TV and film series. There was no vocals, just strange buzzing and pulsating sounds. The broadcast was abruptly stopped after engineers switched frequencies, leaving the bewildered sports presenter and thousands of viewers wondering what had just happened. Take a look. What's happened? <laughs> so am I. That was the first interruption. Then, almost bang on two hours later, an episode of Doctor Who that was being played on WTTW was first interrupted by Static and then none other than Max Headroom. This time, though, he was more audible, mentioning WGN sportscaster Chuck Swirsky, moaning, laughing a series of random unrelated phrases, and holding a Pepsi can while saying, Catch the wave, a reference to Coca Cola's advertising campaign at the time. After continued random phrases and actions, the transmission blacked out and the Doctor Who episode resumed. Take a look. You talk often with the old ones of your tribe. That is the only way to learn. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. Why oh, don't some dry clothes? He's a freaking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm better than Chuck's worst Freaking <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I can tell a massive electric shock. This hijack lasted around 90 seconds, and it was questioned why it couldn't have been stopped sooner. But engineers explained that due to the high microwave signals the hijacker was using, and the lack of engineers on duty at the time, they were not able to intercept sooner. Broadcast experts have said that in order to have a signal strong enough to be able to intercept the shows like they did, they would have needed a very powerful rig, one costing around $25,000 at the time and would have needed to be very close to the WTTW's antenna that was atop of the Sears Tower in downtown Chicago. 
Some people find the Max Headroom interruption scary and some find it funny. But what makes it even stranger is that there doesn't seem to be any motive behind why they did it, apart from it just being a clever prank. And despite investigations, neither the hijacker or his accomplices have ever been identified, and the whole incident still remains unsolved. The 1977 Alien Interruption On the 26th of November 1977, at around 10 past 5 in the evening, the Hannington transmitter used by the Southern Television in the UK was hijacked for six minutes during an early evening news bulletin being read by Andrew Gardner. Thousands of viewers witnessed the incident and were left confused and pretty terrified by the sinister incident, with some believing it had actually come from an alien civilization. The audio hijack was a voice which spoke over the newscaster and was disguised and accompanied by a deep buzzing sound. The speaker claimed to be a representative of an intergalactic association. The message appeared to be a warning to viewers with statements like, all your weapons of evil must be removed and you have a short time to live in peace together. Although there is a transcript of what was said, there is unfortunately no recording, but what you're about to see is a mock-up of what actually happened that is often confused with the real thing. This is the voice of Kumar, representative of the Ashtar Galactic Kumar, speaking to you. For many years, you have seen us as knights and spirits. We speak to you now to say what things we have done to your brothers and sisters all over this, your planet Earth. We come to warn you of the destiny of your race and your world so that you may communicate to your fellow beings the course you must take to avoid the disaster which threatens your world and the beings on other worlds around you. All your weapons of evil must be removed. The time for conflict is now past, and the race of which you are a part may proceed to the higher stages of its evolution if you show yourselves worthy to do this. You have but a short time to learn to live together in peace and goodwill. This is our message. Really as you can imagine, you would be left pretty unnerved if you were watching the news and that came on. It was quickly investigated by UK investigators, who were unable to determine the source of the signal or identify the hijacker. No one has ever come forward over the years to claim responsibility, but since five major transmitters were hijacked simultaneously that evening, whoever was behind it would have required a considerable amount of transmitting power and a very coordinated plan. Zombie Apocalypse in February 2013, Montana television viewers had an episode of the daytime TV program The Steve Wilkos Show suddenly interrupted with an emergency alert system voiceover. But instead of warning viewers of a nuclear attack or natural disaster like it's set up for, it broadcasted the following statement. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely dangerous. The alert was quickly pulled off air and KRTV issued an immediate apology, reassuring viewers that dead bodies were not rising from their graves in Montana and the local police also had to reassure the public that zombies were not taking over. But just imagine if the system was hacked with a more realistic threat, it could cause widespread panic and chaos. It was reported that later on the same night in Michigan, the same type of message about a zombie invasion was made over the emergency system of another station, along with a similar incident in New Mexico. Although this hacker was arrested and charged, but it's unknown if he was also responsible for the Montana incident meaning the person or people behind the zombie apocalypse broadcast may never have been caught. Captain Midnight 
On April the 27th, 1986, John R. McDougall, a man using the name Captain Midnight, hijacked HBO satellite signal to broadcast a message protesting about the high cost of paying for their service. The protest came about when in the mid-80s cable TV was introduced, and the United States media companies that owned pay television channels started scrambling previously accessible programs. So when HBO scrambled its signal in January 1986, and offered subscription prices that were higher than that of cable users, it caused protests. So John McDougall, an engineer at a satellite transmission facility in Florida, decided to act and carried out a test by superimposing a color test pattern on HBO signal. It only lasted a few seconds and went more or less unnoticed as it was broadcast during the early hours. Then a few days later, using his expertise in this area, he transmitted a signal onto the HBO satellite that caused a four and a half minute override during the screening of the movie, The Falcon and the Snowman, displaying this message. This caused panic with Hughes Communications and they threatened to shut down HBO satellite signal, fearing it had been hacked by a domestic terrorist. And as for McDougall, he was caught and charged and after a plea bargain was fined $5,000 and placed on probation for a year. Area 51 call. I said I was saving the best for last and I wasn't lying because this one is truly insane. Coast to Coast AM is a very popular North American radio talk show that has been going since 1984. Well, on September the 11th, 1997, the show's creator and host of the time, Art Bell, received a call from a man claiming to have worked at Area 51. He spoke in a frenzied voice and seemed quite terrified as he spoke of extra-dimensional beings and government plots that would have horrific effects on our world. Now, although this wasn't exactly a hacking like the others, it was incredibly unexpected and caused a strange, unexplained disruption to the transmission. As the caller got more and more upset, the show temporarily went off air. This was caused by a mysterious satellite failure in the transmitter that was carrying the show, leading many to believe the government shut it down to stop him from spilling too much information. Take a listen. Online, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Hi. Um, I... I, I... I don't have a whole lot of uh, time. Um, well, look, let's begin yeah. by finding out whether you're using this line properly or not. Uh, Area 51. Yeah, um, that's right. Were you an employee or are you now? Uh, I, a former employee. Former um, employee. I, I, I was let go on a medical discharge about a week ago, and and <laughs> I, I've kind of been running a, across the country. Um, oh, man, I don't know where to start. There are... Uh, they're, they're gonna, um, they'll triangulate on this position really, really soon. Um, well, you can't spend a lot of time on the phone, so give us something quick. Okay, um, um, okay, what, what we're thinking of as, as aliens are, they're, uh, they're, they're extra dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the, um, the space program made contact with. <laughs> There's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now, Art. But they're not doing, they're not doing anything. They are not. They want the major population centers wiped out so that the, the few that are left will be more easily controllable. Discharge. <laughs> I started getting... In some way, something knocked us off the air, and we're on a backup system now. It's uh, the government, or...? I don't know. It has to be something, though. Well, did you hear... Now, you tell me, because you were listening. 
That was awful strange. There was a really weird guy on the air when it went off? Yeah, real weird out. Like uh, going sort of sort of sounding paranoid, yeah. schizophrenic? Yeah. yeah. And how far into the conversation was it when when it went off? Just a couple, about 15, 20 seconds, I'd say. Oh, you, you, like you guys missed, you, you really missed the call then, and I've got a feeling somebody didn't want you to hear it. The transmitter went belly up suddenly for some unknown reason. I've never seen it do this in all the years, all the years that we've been on the air. I have never seen the transmitter in this way just simply fail, a massively fail, like a massive heart attack or some kind. And so we have gone to a backup system to get si signal to you right now, and I presume it is getting to you right now. Pretty crazy. If it is a hoax, then the man sure is convincing. But this isn't the end of the story. A few minutes later, on April the 28th, 1998, Art Bell received another call, supposedly from the same man, claiming that the first call was all a hoax. End of story. Well, not really. People believe he had been silenced, saying that something just doesn't sound right with the way he's talking, and some say it's not even the same guy. Take a listen to a few clips from the call and see what you think. The East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Uh, this is Brian. Hi, Brian. Hello. Everybody, I am the Area 51 caller. You, you claim you're the Area 51 caller? I, I am the man. How do you account for the fact, Area 51 caller, Okay. that Part of the way through your spiel, the satellite went down. I have no idea, and it scared the heebie-jeebies out of me that night. <laughs> if you're really what you say you are, you created the reality of the rest of the situation and took down my satellite. That scares the heebie-jeebies out of me because it means that what I was saying was somehow correct, and it was fabrication kind of... Creating, um, creating a reality. Yeah, if, if that was the case, I humbly apologize to you because I love your show and the last thing I would ever want to do is not be off the air. air. I, I don't want you to ask me to do this. Um, if, if, if I start doing that, that, that guy, I, you're, I, you're right about that. Now, Huh. Uh, but I just thank you for, for your, your patience in, in dealing with me up to this time. All right, it's quite all right. Thank you. Uh, thank Fritz, uh, Fritz in Phoenix, as a matter of fact, called and said, oh, yes, that's him. Sounds pretty similar, but there is still a lot of debate surrounding the authenticity of both the calls. Some reports suggest the caller is comic book writer Brian J. L. Glass, although this has never been confirmed. So was the whole thing a hoax, or was it really an ex-worker from the mysterious Area 51? who was forced to phone back in and say the first call was a fake. The thing I find strangest is the fact the radio did genuinely cut off his first call, and it's still a mystery as to what caused that and why it happened. So that's five very strange broadcast interruptions, most of which are still left with the mystery as to who was behind them. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and see you next week for another one. Thank you.